Welcome, everyone, to uh, the last This is CDR of 2022. Um, thank you so much for being with us. And also thank you uh, to everyone who has been with us all through the year, to uh, the open air team that helps put it on, and to all the great presenters we've had. Um, it's been a good year, and we're looking forward to 2023. Just some quick background on uh, This is CDR. Um, we're an online event series uh, presented by Open Air to explore the range of carbon removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them specifically for policy proposals Open Air seeks to advance at every level of government in the U.S., as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions locally. <clears throat> if you haven't done so, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. My name is Toby Bryce, uh, based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on um, policy advocacy uh, with Open Air. Quick background on Open Air: We're a volunteer network. Uh, we distributed global volunteer network. We're um, dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions that are essential to solving the climate crisis. Uh, we work together on what we call missions. Um, they're really shared open source projects, uh, member driven in areas of research and development, messaging and communications, policy advocacy, and activist market development. Lots of lots of things going on. It's always possible to start new projects, and we'd love to have you be part of what we're doing. Um, Open Air co-founder Chris Nidal is running the chat, and uh, he will, I think, put a link in there to a form where you can sign up to uh, to join us and get onto our Discord server, which is like Slack and how we kind of communicate and organize ourselves. Before we get started with today's program, as always, uh, just a quick definition of what we're talking about here when we talk about carbon removal. Um, carbon removal, and this definition is from a, a, a really valuable resource called the Carbon CDR Primer. Um, it was a, kind of an open source document collaborated on by 50 plus carbon removal experts from academia and other research institutions. Um, and it's also the same definition essentially that the IPCC uses, but carbon removal is purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. There are two really important um, things to call out up front when you're talking about carbon removal. Number one, carbon removal is distinct from what's typically called carbon capture, which uh, typically means um, capturing CO2 from an emission source like a natural gas power plant or a cement plant, um, depending on the context that may or may not be a good climate solution. Um, but one thing it's not is carbon removal, which again is specifically, very specifically removing CO2 from the atmosphere and durably storing it. Number two, um, when we talk about carbon removal, it's really essential, critical to call out up front that carbon removal is in no way, shape or form any sort of substitute for reducing emissions. Um, we need to reduce emissions, decarbonize our global economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. It's non-negotiable. We have to do it. That said, there's clear scientific consensus that <clears throat> by mid-century, gigaton scale carbon removal will be required if we want to have any chance of limiting warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, um, we're not going to be able to completely decarbonize our economy. Certain sectors called hard to abate sectors. I think the biggest one is agriculture and food systems. We're not going to be able to completely eliminate those emissions in a time, in a climate relevant time frame. Number two, it's unreasonable to expect uh, the global south, the developing world to decarbonize as quickly as the global north, particularly given that the global north is responsible for effectively all of the CO2 in the atmosphere. So there are equity issues as well. So for those reasons, carbon removal will be required. Um, additionally, in the second half of the century, we're going to have to scale carbon removal even further because we have trillions of tons of anthropogenic CO2 already in the atmosphere, and some of that's going to need to come down, and we're going to need to use, use carbon removal to make that happen. So just some really important points to like to, to, to clarify up front. Um, Chris will also put some other background resources in the chat, including the link to the 56 previous This is CDR episodes. So there are lots of great ways online to learn more about carbon removal. And we're very excited to be learning more today. And my colleague and special guest co-host, uh, Irene Polini, is going to be coming on now to uh, talk a little bit about Run of Show and introduce today's session. Irene? Good afternoon from beautiful Brooklyn. Hi, I'm Irene Polini, and I'm an open air advocate and an ocean climate enthusiast, which I write about in my newsletter, Salty Water. Um, some housekeeping notes, our format will be a short presentation followed by a few prepared questions, then a moderated audience Q&A. So if you have questions that are coming up for you as you listen to the presentation, please put them in the Zoom's Q&A box, not the chat. This event is also being recorded. We'll send the video link to everyone who registered and also it will be on Open Air's website and YouTube channel. 
This week, we're pleased to welcome Brilliant Planet founder and chief scientist, Dr. Rafael Jovine, who will discuss how the company unlocks the power of algae as an affordable method to durably and quantifiably sequester carbon at a gigaton scale. The company's innovative process enables vast quantities of microalgae to grow in open air pond systems on a coastal desert land. This is achieved without using fresh water by harnessing a natural process that contributes to the health of oceans and air. A little bit about Dr. Rafael Jovine. He's a trained, he's trained in molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale. He did his PhD in marine science, sciences at UC Santa Barbara and completed research at MIT. In 2013, he founded and is now the chief scientist of Brilliant Planet, a company that uses seawater, sunlight, and wind to grow food in coastal deserts, replicating algal blooms. He's married with five children and lives in London. Dr. Jovine, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. And I have to say, um, before I start, uh, I really admire the um, open air community and the ability to uh, do all the advocacy work and the, um, and the uh, uh, wonderful sort of policy and analysis that you do, which is very impactful. So I am super pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, today, as you have said, I am going to, one second, while I figure this out, talk about how Brilliant Planet came about, what we do, and, and why it matters. Not so much why it matters from a carbon sequestration point of view, while that is extremely important, but why it matters to us to be able to use natural resources that are underutilized to give them the most uh, quick and effective impact that we can try to, to achieve. Um, I'm going to start a little video which is an earth simulation from NOAA to show you how global chlorophyll and ocean productivity sort of evolves over a year along the coastlines. And what you can see here is that along usually Western boundary currents and areas that are relatively nutrient rich because of upwelling water where deep nutrient and carbon rich water comes to the surface, feeds um, the, the oceans. Now the oceans are very large and what you're seeing here all that red and orange color and these coastal blooms are moving 183 tons of co2 gigatons of co2 per year so it's a very very large system and the ocean itself is an enormous carbon reservoir and so it feeds about five times more animals than there are on land and it is a incredibly powerful system to, to move very large quantities of CO2. So in 2008, I wrote the original method of carbon sequestration patent that tried to sort of look at how we can use those blooms for the purpose of growing more algae and creating net new primary productivity so that we could then uh, increase the biological turnover. Um, just we, we, later in the presentation, I'll talk about things like, do we nutrient deplete the local seawater? Um, are there limits to the system and how large this uh, is? But just to start with, uh, the ocean is an enormous reservoir. It has 38,000 plus gigatons of carbon in it. Uh, that's nearly 140,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. So it is just an enormous place. And what we're trying to do is just move a little bit extra on top of that. Um, the way we do this is we work with local organisms. And this is really important. As you um, described in the introduction, we are an open system. And from a social responsibility and not messing up anything, we have to work with a local organism. We want to make sure, and from the very beginning, we've been thinking about what the sort of local impact is. And the reason why I say that is um, these organisms actually are also extremely good at growing in these local environments. It turns out that the coastal ocean is very niche. It is many small little ecosystems right next to each other. And these organisms are acclimated and adapted to those environments and do very, very well in growing. 
there's another thing here, which is these are mostly diatoms. Diatoms alone move about 20 gigatons of carbon, just this type of organism alone, which makes the little silicate shells and these things called frustules. And as you can see, a lot of them are chain formers or have these long hair and structures sticking out of them, which are made of silicate, and they're extremely easy to harvest and actually get out of the water. And so the sort of physical qualities and the biological qualities of these organisms um, are, are, are really important to us to lower the cost of production, to take advantage of what the local ecosystem has to offer. And especially because these organisms are the so-called bloom formers. Uh, as I said, there are five times more animals in the ocean than there are on land. And many of those animals are fed by these diatoms. These are the benign blooms that feed the ocean that are at the bottom of the food chain and um, are, are creating a lot of those nutritional uh, about that nutritional value. If you, so to describe how we work with them, I'm going to, uh, go uh, switch screens to be able to, um, get to another, uh, screen. If you give me a second. And I'm going to go through how we work with our, um, with those local organisms in that coastal ocean water. So we start with a seawater intake. And in this illustration here, what you're seeing is, is that the sea water intake is sort of on a long pipeline going quite deep. Now, this is very important. We work below the euphotic zone, below the mixed layer depth. We try to access this very nutrient rich, deep, ancient, very clean, cold, upwelling water year round. So one of the things that happens in these blooms in nature is that the blooms are um, episodic. And we want to be able to bring those blooms on land in a controlled system and repeat them year long, every day. And so the idea is, is we are able to pump water from quite close to the shore in these areas that are rich in upwelling water that are uh, quite um, that feed these natural blooms. But we do this year round. Um, if you then go to the land, what you will see is, is that we have a pump house. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how to pump things at, with very little energy. We move an enormous amount of water, and we'll get back to that later. And, and even today in our three hectare sort of experimental farm, we are, we are um, moving a lot of water. So we think about pump energy and pump design a lot. The pump is just there to feed our ponds in a very high throughput way, these algal blooms. The cells divide every day or more than once every day. And in that process, we need to replace the water in our ponds all the time. And so the pump is very critical. The next thing is, is that we have a laboratory. Now, the laboratory is very important because we have these single cells, these organisms that we showed earlier, these local isolates, and, and they're clean. They're a monoculture. It's just one organism. And it is very important that that organism is, in a sense, happy and, and is actively growing. But it is still under lab conditions. And even uh, though we have gotten very good at recreating Moroccan conditions in the lab, um, the fact is, is that the lab conditions, it's very difficult to maintain that exponential growth and to do it in such a way uh, that the cells are really ready to go outside. So for that reason, our monoculture is sort of grown up from a very small little 96 well plate, a little micro titer dish, uh, 200 microliters, four drops of, of water. Um, and we then grow that up and so that it divides every day. And then, you know, the next day it's two, 400 microliters and 800 and 1.6 milliliters. And it goes very quickly. And in a, in a very short period of time, you get in your lab bigger, bigger, bigger than in your greenhouse, which is this. We move ourselves to the greenhouse and same idea. You have an inoculum of water. When it gets hungry, we add more seawater with its natural nutrients at the level that you would expect them. And then they get bigger, bigger, bigger because we keep adding water to feed them. And then as the cells actually increase in volume, eventually the pond is too small. So then we transfer the entire pond to the next larger pond and again, repeat the process. And it goes very quickly from there because next after the greenhouse are our ponds. On the left, you see sort of the intermediate ponds. And on the right, you see these uh, large final cultivation ponds where we then 
uh, actually grow to this point where we cannot increase the pond size much more because of physical limitations in terms of wind fetch and moving that water. There's another detail in this drawing here, which is you see that the greenhouse on the left is a little bit higher than the ponds in the middle, which are a little bit higher than the ponds on the right. One of the things that we've looked at is how to do all of these steps very efficiently without using pumps, um, learning from the shrimp farmers, for example, how to gravity drain uh, everything. So we pump once that then cascades down through the system so that we don't spend a lot of time and energy um, on doing all those transfers. And the same thing with our paddle wheels. We've had a um, collaboration with Southampton University uh, to improve the computational fluid dynamics in our ponds, but also the quality of the and understanding how to use those paddle wheels more effectively. And, uh, and we saved another 87% of the paddle wheel energy just by doing that. And there are many examples of that. If we go from the uh, harvesting ponds, that final pond, we move to the filtration center. Now, what a filtration center is, is a bunch, I'll show some pictures later, uh, is just a bunch of very low energy, again, gravity uh, supplied filtration screens. We've learned that from the mining industry, again, trying to use existing technology for the sake of not having to reinvent the wheel and, and being able to scale up very quickly. From the filtration center where we separate the algae from the seawater, we have now two things. We have the actual algal slurry and we have the uh, nutrient depleted seawater. But the algal slurry goes to the uh, drying field and the drying field is uh, very important for us. We very quickly dry the algae by spraying them in the desert. The desert uh, helps us to dry the algae very quickly. We're working on a system where from the harvesting site to being dry on the drying pad, we spend somewhere around eight minutes time. It's it's supposed to be quick and it's deliberately designed to, to make the, the drying field um, able to handle a lot of the biomass in the sun. And we can talk about that later as well, because the quality of the biomass before burial is very important. The other aspect is that we need to actually return the remainder of the water. We only use the water once. We do not recycle anything. It's very important not to recycle anything. So the outlet here is illustrated a little bit generously. Uh, it really is at the surface. It's very important that we take deep nutrient wa rich water and we return it to the surface as slightly warmed up, much more naturally depleted, just like the local surface water is back to the surface. It is also important from a carbon atmospheric carbon reabsorption point of view. And then finally, um, we have a so-called, it's, it's a US EPA term, a dry tomb um, uh, biomass burial site. And we'll talk about that. It's got to be stable for very long periods of time, and it's got to be in geologically safe areas. Um, what this is on the left is, the whole trick to this is, is for us to listen to the algae. It is extremely important that we understand what the algae want. The actual operation of adding water, transferring to the next larger pond, adding water, transferring to the next larger pond is really quite simple. Um, but the how much you add, when to add, at what temperature to add, do you add it quickly or slowly? How fast does that paddle wheel go? How deep do we run the pond to be able to manage the light field in our pond? That's where we work, uh, in this case, we do, we are very good at photophysiology. Um, on the right, you're seeing a so-called lab staff, uh, which is a fast repetition rate fluorometer that has been modified specifically to work with the high cell counts that we operate in. We actually help to develop a lot of these sensors. Uh, we've got patents on these sensors. And the reason why I say that is, is um, the, our core skills to understand the algal photophysiology, nutrient physiology, how they respond to temperature, light, um, the seawater chemistry. And it's very important for us to understand as the seasons change, how to keep up the growth. Um, if you go to the next slide, what you see that information then flows into a operational model. This operational model is so that we can scatter control or automatically control our pond based on these kinds of sensor inputs. And we are very careful to measure at every stage the dissolved inorganic carbon, the alkalinity, the electric conductivity, the temperature, where our bicarbonate is, where our carbonate is, how much free CO2 there is, uh, the pH of the pond, 
when the light field is, when we should be doing these dilutions, that's that big blue line sort of in the center top, for the sake of controlling the conditions in the ponds to make the algae happy so that they continue to grow in a very fast exponential way. And it is in the subtleties of the control that are embedded in this growth model and in this uh, SCADA logic that allows us to run our ponds very fast. And, um, and to manage that throughput of those large amounts of water. Now, it's very clear, and I, I'm not giving away big secrets here. If you look at these huge ponds and you fill them with thousands of sensors, it's a very expensive proposition. So for us to automate these sensors, there are real limits to what we can achieve in terms of the capital expenditures associated with that. On the left, you're seeing a picture of um, our existing three hectare experimental site. There are different levels of pond, uh, fill of those ponds. Um, you can even look inside the greenhouse on the bottom left. But what you're seeing is, is that there's sort of different colors after the ponds have been operating as they're being transferred. So for example, that dark brown pond in the middle, in the center, uh, has not yet been transferred, whereas the, the lighter brown middle pond has already been transferred and refilled and is in the process of getting to the next level. Now we collect all that data. We have those operational data and we can see them from space. So we have already begun to use remote sensing to try to understand how the same information can be collected with remote sensing. Uh, this is an image where we're using the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 uh, program. We've done it with the Planet uh, Low Earth Orbit satellite. Um, these are so-called uh, uh, sun synchronous orbits. They, they, they come over at approximately noon time. And just a couple uh, uh, days later, you can see how the conditions have already changed. And you can uh, do the, uh, this in many different ways. And we're looking at actually uh, using hyperspectral data now because um, it gives us even more information. But the idea is, is we want to we know how our cells grow. We know how deep the pond is at the time that the sensor went over. We have a white background. We know the path length so that we can define what the light absorption was. We actually measure pond leaving radiation and the, in, the, uh, the, the incident radiation at every three minutes. And so the point is, is we know exactly what to expect and how to measure it uh, without using all those sensors. And we're in the process of abstracting all that sensor information into something that is automatable on a very large scale. And that's the important bit. It's, it's wonderful to do this. It's great fun and good research, but we need to be able to do it on a large scale. Um, what you're seeing here on the left is this, we've done something very similar in the ocean. So this is based on our so-called finite volume community ocean model. It is a model uh, that's a triangular unstructured mesh network. Uh, its boundaries are forced from a basin scale model that goes all the way past the Canary Islands, all the way north to Gibraltar and quite far south. And, and it allows us to make extremely detailed local forecasts about what's happening underwater. But more importantly, this model isn't um, just a model. It's actually driven by our mooring data. We have a mooring with seven levels uh, of temperature measurements. I'll show that uh, next. And this mooring um, and the wind measurements, which we do ourselves, um, we have two MET stations, uh, drive this model. It's been verified. The model is very useful for us because what you're seeing here on the left is, is that in the summer under normal operational conditions, even when there's this warm blob of uh, uh, sort of water coming from the canaries. On the left side, you see that blue and light blue area where we've got colder water, which is that nutrient-rich upwelling water that sort of pumps to the surface. Um, this is also true. This is a zoom in of the same conditions in the winter time when the conditions have changed quite significantly. And again, you can see that blue water sort of surging to the surface allowing us to anticipate exactly when the good water is around, what nutrients we can expect, what the quality of that is. And this is a combination of modeling as well as measurements. And we can verify all of that very easily by measuring what's coming through the pipeline. Now, what that does is it grows a lot of biomass. And so the biomass um, is, 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 is very important for us to get rid of all that excess water, 
to get the biomass out of the water to work with these relatively low cost, high throughput screening systems that remove normally mining fines. And as you can see, it looks sort of like brown um, pea soup. It's a quite thick slurry. Um, but this whole process is gravity fed so that it moves very fast, but it doesn't, again, take a lot of energy. Now, a lot of questions come up about this biomass in the sense, is it permanent? Is it stable? What can you do with it? And so, and so, um, it looks sort of like this. It becomes very flaky after we spray it into the desert. Um, it's, it's, it's a, a, uh, kind of plasticky feeling material. Um, it is very uh, different than sort of things like distiller's grain or things that come out of uh, wastewater treatment sludge. Um, it's very different than woody biomass. And so we've had to spend a lot of time to think about how to preserve this very effectively. And um, that we have sort of a triple lock, which is that when we dry it in the desert, we try to dry it as dry as possible to a degree which is much higher than you would normally expect. Um, that is fortunately possible in the desert. Uh, some places like Oman, it's really easy. In Morocco, it takes a little bit longer because you've got moist air coming from the ocean. So you just have to adapt to the local circumstances. But the dryness is extremely important and keeping it dry is extremely important. The second uh, sort of protection is that it is very salty. So we try to be at minimum 20% in terms of the salt content. Your pickles in your refrigerator are somewhere between 1.2 and 1.6% salt. And um, it is much saltier uh, than sort of food preservation or more familiar things um, uh, that you might encounter. Now, the reason why I say that is both the dryness and the saltiness give us a reference to naturally mummified uh, actually mummies that have been around for 3,600 years um, and are incredibly well characterized and unbelievably well preserved. And so for us, it was very important to find, again, a system that is very simple, but that the additional seawater and the salt water content gets used in a constructive way for the purpose of making the spine mass very stable. In addition to that, uh, we actually measure this. So when we bury this, we bury it together with a whole bunch of sensors. We measure whether there is uh, methane, whether there are methane emissions, uh, nitrous oxide emissions, carbon monoxide emissions, CO2 emission, volatile organic gases, or even things like ammonia. The answer is because we dry so quickly in the desert sun, um, we don't have any of those issues. Those the screens on the left, for example, all these. Uh, organisms are retained, but the bacteria wash through the screens and go out with the seawater. Um, why that matters is because we're in a very oxygenic environment, so there's no possibility for methanogenesis, but also there's no time to do that. And this material is both dry and salty before we bury it. The second thing is it also is autocatalytic, and the cells become very acidic very quickly. And so the third protection is that we drive, deliberately drive down the pH of the biomass um, to less than 3.6, uh, which is very acidic. You know this from your fizzy drinks and from your marmalade, which are, uh, again, very acidic and well stored. And so it's dry, acidic, and, um, and, and, and very salty. In addition to that, we find that our proteins and nucleic acids are cross-linked by the UV light in the sun. And so it just becomes very, very stable. Uh, and we then actually track that stability, both during the drying process and when we go into the ground. Um, I've just mentioned before our finite volume community ocean model, the FECOM model, model, and our mooring. These are mooring data from uh, the local system. So we are very aware of how the seasonality changes. There are some of our weather data below in terms of just how the wind changes. So we have very, as you can see here, most of those errors are pointing down. We have very good predictability of the wind direction, of wind force. Um, we know when to expect sort of the, the kind of uh, seasonal events and, and it's a very stable environment in that sense. And it allows us to plan our operations very effectively. Again, this is very important for us to also do two things. One is to model our discharge. 
So we know exactly where our uh, discharge is going, and this is again using the same um, the same modeling system uh, to define a single point discharge. And in this case, um, what you're seeing in the sort of dye tracer study, the red stuff in the uh, sort of moving with the tide and moving with the current along shore. This is very important because we know. Uh, that we deacidify and remove a lot of the CO2 from the seawater, and we know how low the partial pressure of that CO2 is in that seawater, how quickly it absorbs uh, the atmospheric CO2, um, and we know exactly how fast it is doing it and where it is doing it. And if you look at this, uh, you can see things with models that you could not possibly measure. So those kind of light green turquoise and kind of blue colors on the edges are, are uh, 10 to the minus 15, uh, so that's uh, femtomolar concentrations of what we released at the, at the head of our site. And the reason why I say that is we use these models to exactly know where to put our, our mooring, uh, but we can work with things like um, sail drones, for example. Um, we can work with the Boeing uh, wave glider or the aquanaut system to actually trace our discharge. And we're working with the sensor developers right now to measure things like pH and alkalinity in that, in that discharge stream. Um, moving on to scale this up, we also, uh, need to plan a lot of the engineering work. And, and this is another illustration. It wouldn't look quite like this. There wouldn't be so many sandy strips in between our pond, pond arrays. But the idea is, is that we want to build these things in a very modular way. It's very important that these modules, uh, are planned in a sense from a, from a construction point of view, um, so that we can scale this up worldwide, that we know exactly what to anticipate, but also that we can scale up to fit the local sites as much as we need to. Um, these these ponds have a very large surface area and they absorb a lot of the atmospheric CO2 as we run them. And so it's very important that we sort of understand the local conditions, where the wind comes from, how to orient the ponds relative to the wind. And, and, and we've got a whole engineering team that is thinking about the details of how to do this. So for example, instead of using high carbon content steel, we use... Uh, glass reinforced fiber poles that are as strong that have a much lower carbon content. We're thinking about using uh, recycled HDPE as opposed to uh, virgin HDPE. And for example, the kind of concrete collars that need to support our pipeline in the ocean, we use a concrete that is uh, an actively cultivating local organisms so that it in turn creates an artificial reef, but also um, re absorbs carbon dioxide directly. And so there's a lot of uh, the devil's in the detail and in a sense to be able to scale this up, we're trying to work on all those details now. Um, now, from a scaling point of view, we've done a global GIS analysis, and this is just an image from a part of the Moroccan Mediterranean coast. And it's a rules-based analysis that looks at the flatness of the land, the fact that it isn't occupied by anything, not by infrastructure, not by agriculture, not by some biologically active system. It has to be truly coastal desert, hot desert. And we've uh, done this on a global scale, and we've identified about half a million square kilometers of um, ideal land around the planet. And um, the reason why I say ideal land is this because it's um, in relatively politically stable countries, in places where, again, we're not getting in the way of anything, um, and and where we have the ability to roll out uh, our sort of pond modules in 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 in, in large areas. Um, the reason why I say this is because there's about um, 19 and a half million square kilometers of the hot desert. That's more land than the U.S. and EU combined. It's underutilized land with underutilized deep sea water with a lot of uh, sunlight. So we have all the ingredients to save a lot of cost. And, and, and we've been thinking about how to manage the energy inputs, how to manage the sort of um, operational costs by reducing, for example, the sensors, um, how to 
automate this in an effective way so that the system can run uh, very quickly um, and take advantage of those local algae growing with all that seawater. And um, we've been thinking a lot about the, the permanence of this uh, biomass and, and how stable it is going to be. That includes, for example, um, doing the local geology to make sure that our burial sites are above future sea level rise that uh, the material that we bury stays dry, even if there were a rainfall or a massive sort of change in weather hundreds of years from now, by, by capping the sites, working in areas that are not in watersheds. And, and again, trying to do this in as low cost but stable way as possible. And, and making sure that the, that this, this is all truly additional in the sense that we're not replacing anything. We're creating quite a lot of new net primary productivity on empty land that has neither biodiversity nor productivity using resources that are readily available. And we can get to some of the questions. When people ask, are we depleting the local nutrient environment after this? But the answer is we don't. And so there's a lot of work thinking about the additionality. Obviously, it's got to be measured. We measure the seawater when it comes into the system. We measure the seawater in the pond. We measure our discharge. We measure the actual biomass underground when it is buried. We spent a lot of time trying to find sensors that don't get corroded by our biomass. Our biomass is odd. It's unusual. And these sensors have to work over very long periods of time. We don't want to be digging up our biomass all the time. And so we've worked with a lot of sensor developers and working on finding solid state sensors that can provide very early indicators of decay, for example, or things getting wet. And then we have, uh, you know, the gas sampling as well. So it's very measurable. Uh, obviously, scalability is everything. If we're going to make an impact, we've got to get this out quickly to the whole world. And, and a lot of the engineering has come from that. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, we've been very careful to think about no competing uses for the biomass. So we don't want somebody digging this up and burning it. It's not going to burn. It's sandy. It's salty. Uh, it'll eat your furnace. It is very corrosive. It's very salty and acidic. It is actually very difficult to burn. So, so, um, and, and there's really nobody's going to use this as a fertilizer again because it's super salty. Uh, you can build right on top of a landfill. I doubt that anybody would ever want to build in the places where we operate, but the fact is it doesn't actually change the landscape once we cover it, uh, with a local sort of desert, desert, uh, topsoil again. The point is, is you, it's, it's going to be truly buried. Um, and, and it has a lot of co-benefits. The co-benefits come in us deacidifying a lot of local seawater and restoring that environment back to pre-industrial levels. And, and, and the reason why I say that is, um, we're very concerned, uh, that we, because we move very large amounts of water, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the, uh, because we move such large amounts of water, that this water becomes a new resource. And in future, we're looking at ways of using that water to actively promote biodiversity and increase the local environmental capacity. Now, this is a picture of our existing three hectare research site. And, and, and you can see uh, one of our large ponds. And the reason I'm bringing this up is when we started this discussion at the very beginning with those global ocean coastal blooms, um, that was the inspiration. But as you can imagine, uh, when I started this with uh, a man called Keith Coleman, and we went to South Africa in the beginning in our first trial site in South Africa, we were very successful. It went very quickly and he was instrumental in getting everything launched. But as so many companies, there's so many details to work out. And with COVID, um, we had sort of lost focus on how to get to carbon sequestration. And, and, and when we reached out to the carbon community, they said, if you figure out how to scale this up and to do this, um, at very low cost so that we can draw down carbon, we will fund you. So we got funding from Union Square Ventures, which was fantastic. Um, we got funding from S2G, which is, uh, like Builders Vision, one of the, uh, West Coast funds. Um, we got funding from Toyota Ventures. Grantham Foundation came in. Uh, our Series A was all about professionalizing and was about building up 
the systems, finding a CEO, Adam Taylor, who has actually built a lot of aquaculture ponds in Uganda, Zambia, and has operated um, on a very large scale, building the largest uh, fish farm in Africa very successfully to build a really beautiful company, actually. And so the idea was we could get funding if we learned how to um, industrialize this, uh, professionalize this, and scale this up. Um, for example, this has allowed this funding has allowed us to hire somebody like Mert Yesege, who was the chief designer uh, at Mort McDonald for the Thames Super Sewer. Uh, it's called Thamesway, and it takes the entire sewage overflow from all of London and processes it in a tunnel that goes underneath the Thames, all the way past the Thames barrier, and passes it through a huge uh, water treatment plant. So, so the idea is this is all about that scale up and that professionalization. Um, I know you have questions about about our productivity and how many hectares we use, and, and I'm happy to answer those. So I'll stop sharing, and then we can we can happily talk about the questions. I hope that makes sense. No, that was fantastic. Thank you, Raphael. One quick logistical question: um, <clears throat> running a little bit late. Or do you have a hard stop at the top of the hour? Or could you? Stay I do I not. So maybe we'll keep we'll keep it going an extra five or ten minutes just so that we can cover as many of the audience questions as possible. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, we always like to start with a little bit of your personal history, and maybe we could just sort of focus it on when did you get interested in algae, and when did you have the realization that algae could be a, a vehicle for long duration carbon removal? Like, how did that thought process and discovery process work for you? I I'm actually a gene bender by training. I loved algae because I loved. I wanted to figure out photosynthesis. And they were fantastic photosynthetic model systems. There are many more uh, photosynthetic systems in the ocean than there are on land. And so I always worked with algae purely from a photosynthesis research point of view as an undergraduate and in graduate school. And um, at some point, my professor at UCSB said, well, this is all really wonderful stuff, but you understand nothing about photosynthesis. Uh, if you go out in the real world and see how the algae grow, you'll learn a lot more. And she was right. She was absolutely right in the sense that in the real world, under very challenging conditions with very low nutrients, these algae were growing near the theoretical maximum of photosynthesis. So I knew there was something there. And then I went to Woods Hole Oceanographic at Woods Hole. We were looking at harmful algal blooms and how to stop them. And, and I realized these blooms are very special. And if we want to do something about the planet, um, this is our big tool uh, with which we can move huge resources. And that's how that whole story came And, and you said this was this sort of insight came to you in 2008 timeframe? Uh, it came to me before that, but there, I, I, I had a little detour uh, via uh, management consulting, and I didn't know how to turn that into a business. And so the, the, the patent came out of the idea of trying to industrialize this and turn this into a business. I'm not saying I got there very quickly, but, but that's the idea. Well, here you are, and that's what's important. <laughs> um, that's great. Thank you. Um, I All right. So we talked about this a little bit. I'm going to put a link in the chat to Lower Carbon Capital CDR startup wish list from a few months ago. And one of the areas of interest was biomass sequestration. And they kind of express a couple general concerns about sequestering biomass that need to be addressed for it to be you know, successful carbon removal. And you touched on these, but let's maybe just recap why these are are or are not an issue for you and how you address them. So number one, the big quote unquote elephant in the room is methanogenesis. You know, we don't want to, just because the GWP of methane is so much higher than that of carbon dioxide, we don't want to like sequester CO2 and release methane. So you talked about this. Um, and I believe what I got was that the the methanogenic, the methanogens will not consume the sequestered algae because of its dryness, its salinity, and its acidity. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Each one of those alone would be enough to discourage bacterial growth. And, and, there been, sorry. and, and to add to that, we are in an oxygenic environment. Methanogenesis usually happens in anoxic environments. We even measure our uh, oxygen content underground because it's a very easy early indicator if things are consuming oxygen. And so um, the fact is when we make those ultra dry burial tombs, where there's no groundwater incursion, no fresh surface water incursion uh, in, in these long-term dry places, it is very much like a known 
uh, funerary mummies and 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 burial systems. And so so there's good confidence that any one of those three will 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 preserve the biomass. And I'm sorry, did you say it, it, the burial tomb is anaerobic or aerobic or oxygen? It's aerobic. It's, it's aerobic. aerobic. So there is oxygen. Yeah. So you really the the larger practical concern is decomposition, aerobic decomposition. Yes, and 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 even that we're tracking. Um, but the fact is, is again, it is so stable. Um, the the algae don't. Um, I mean, if we actually really struggle with getting a functional decay curve because the algae are so stable that once they are buried, that they just don't decay. And is there like prior research addressing these questions that you know methanogens do not consume? high salinity material or like, has there been a past research or these things that you're kind of discovering and then that you'll need to kind of monitor and prove out? It's a little bit of combination. So food science has done a lot when it kind of gets to water activity, acidity, um, and, and, and again, the saltiness. Um, So there are many systems that have studied this very actively, Uh, but there are also many natural systems, things like uh, dry valley seals in Antarctica and and um, other systems where there's dry biomass, natural biomass in the deserts. And so we're sort of trying to combine the two. Um, the real research that we're doing to help address some of these challenges is the sensor research, making sure that we actually have very early indications if there are any issues. Um, a, because we can destroy methane actively if there were any. Uh, we've looked into that. B, we can actually, um, in a sense, blow dry air into the ground if we needed to. I don't think that'll ever happen. But the fact is, it's their mitigation measures as well. But there's no thing to mitigate if you don't know it. So right. the fact is, is we spent the effort on trying to find the right sensors. Got it. Cool. And and the other the other big general concern they talk about, which you again alluded to, was nutrient loss or nutrient export from the biosphere or ecosphere to the geosphere. So you are taking a lot of nutrient from the deep ocean, converting it into biomass and then burying it. Can you explain why that is or is not a concern with your method? So the first thing is we look for algae and for organisms that have a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. We don't want to add a lot of nitrogen. And so when I show you the picture of the diatoms, we're not looking for ones that are very lipid forming, for example, uh, because that takes a lot of energy and doesn't grow very fast, but we're also not looking for ones that require a huge amount of protein. So the fact is, is the faster they grow, uh, the leaner they are. You can think of this as teenagers. They, they're very lean and efficient at growing, but they're, they're, they do consume a lot, but we just don't give them a whole lot of nitrogen. The ocean actually has, uh, just from an ocean geochemical cycle, about 2,000 years worth of nitrogen in it to support that euphotic zone, that algae layer on the top where all the biological activity is. The ocean's actually very, very large. Um, and so we uh, have spent quite a lot of time thinking about how much nutrients we take out. It's less than 0.1% of what would have come up anyway in any year um, in front of our farm a kilometer out to sea. Um, because fundamentally, our pipeline, if you think of our pipeline as sort of a hose going down and there's a, and there's a surface layer, we penetrate that surface layer, but the upwelling that locally happens, happens anyway. That, that little bit that we remove from the deep ocean doesn't stop any of that upwelling from happening. So the local environment continues to be an upwelling area and we grow, uh, additional algae that wouldn't have otherwise grown in the empty desert. Got it. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. So just some quick metric questions. You mentioned your pipelines. Uh, you know, a lot of kind of commonly said these days that ultimately carbon removal is a logistics business, you know, science-based, but like ultimately we're going to have to move billions of tons of material, which is a lot. Um, can you just give a sense of the scale that we're talking about per ton of net CO2 equivalent sequestration? How much water do you have to move? Like, Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's a natural system. We're not overdriving this uh, the way that, for example, biofuel algae were grown. So um, we use about 22,000 tons, 22,000 tons of seawater to remove one ton of CO2. So as you can imagine, we have thought a lot about... 22 trillion that. tons per gigaton. Exactly. exactly. That's a lot. Okay. Uh, um, exactly. And another two, uh, another metric question that I think overlaps with at least one audience question. So your process is kind of you're broken out into capture and then storage. Um, for the capture piece, um, uh, can you talk about your land use or number of tons of sequestration per hectare? And then for the 
for the tombs, how much land does each uh, or how much carbon can you sequester per hectare or whatever the easiest way to express that? Yeah, so, so very simply, we, it's very easy, 100 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. That's the that's the operational metric. And we spent a lot of time getting there. Um, and the reason um, why I say that it's entirely based on that fast high throughput cycle. Um, 100 tons of CO2 per year ends up being about 62 tons of dry biomass. And you can, uh, uh, can compress that and, and in a sense, um, store that very effectively by just going a couple meters deep in the desert. So for a thousand hectare site, which does about a hundred thousand tons of CO2 per year, we need about two hectares, 20,000 square meters in burial site. So it's not an enormous amount of area. So that, that that's, that's, so you can capture, sorry, uh, you said you can capture 10,000, a hundred, what is it? A hundred, you can capture a hundred thousand tons per. Per, for a thousand hectare operational okay. module. A thousand tons per hectare of capture. Yeah. Uh, and then, no, a yeah. hundred tons per hectare CO2 we capture. And then if we have a thousand hectare, that would be a hundred thousand tons. Okay. And a hundred thousand tons sort of biomass worth, we bury in about two hectares of landfill. Okay. So it's, it's so 50,000 tons of burial. You need, you need 50,000 tons per hectare for burial. For the team. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, you can say it like that. Yes, okay. that's correct. That's correct. And okay. and and the fact is, uh, where we are, there's a lot of empty desert land. Yeah. This is not prime real estate. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's just good to like it helps you understand where this is going from a scaling perspective to get those kind of metrics down. One last question. I mean, I have a ton more, but we want to leave some time for the many good audience questions we have. Um, obviously, uh, MRV is a huge topic in carbon removal more generally. Um, can you talk about how your MRV works? Because as I understand it, your your algae are removing carbon from the seawater and then you're sequestering that. But to actually get, to get the atmospheric carbon removal, the seawater needs to then draw down the compensatory carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So like, how does that MRV work? And that's a common challenge for all ocean-based CDR, I would add. Yeah, and justifiably, I think it's the right question. So number one, we measure the water coming in in the ponds and as it leaves the system. So we, the system is extremely well characterized. And when I mean measure, that really, again, means the uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, the alkalinity. We do not remove any alkalinity. We don't actually uh, remove any of the calcium and magnesium and sort of the countervailing ions. We just remove the CO2. So why, I, or the end of bicarbonate, half of that re-equilibrates with the atmosphere before we go back out to the ocean. So there's a lot of atmospheric CO2 um, in our actual ponds and as our ponds and uh, get diluted and move along and the algae grow. And we can document that very well. We have a, uh, a wonderful lady who sets up environmental monitoring programs and sort of automate it, is in the process of automating all that data collection. And the second half, as you say correctly, when we discharge that plume that you saw in that water, is, is, is that model is very important for us to know where to put our sensors. So we can actually track because our water is so low in carbon dioxide and bicarbonate, it reabsorbs atmospheric CO2 very quickly. There's no back pressure. We've removed the partial pressure of the fugacity of that CO2. Um, and so it makes it very quick to reabsorb CO2, but we can actually track that and measure that. Um, and so in that sense, uh, the, 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 again, we're working, we've got our sensors already. We're working with an outfit at Southampton University that builds these on ROVs, for example. And then we can make transects through our discharge bloom to actually verify independently, uh, and, and, and have people like the Vera's and the Puro's of the world actually review and certify that data. And, and is it, is it your sort of assertion that, um, you know, per Henry's law, if you remove a ton of or your algae remove a ton of CO2 from the cycled seawater, then the seawater will effectively, in a climate relevant time frame, like now, remove a full ton? Or do you feel like it's a little more complicated than that? <laughs> yes, you've been exposed to the right question. So seawater chemistry is complicated by temperature. We reabsorb about 0.85 of a ton uh, in terms of our discharge water, if we were to add additional alkalinity. But the point is, is yes, it's not exactly this, uh, uh, equilibrated, but importantly, um, again, half of it happens in the pond. There's 
85% uh, um, sort of reabsorption within four to a half to five days of our discharge, because again, we have such fast reabsorption. So it's not a question of having to track this for months as with some other open motion systems. Got it. All right, I'm going to stop. Uh, I've gone over my time. Um, is it okay if we go to quarter past the hour? Of course. Right, we'll go to quarter past the hour. Irene, you want to hop on and um, tackle some of these excellent audience questions? Thank you so much. And I hope that um, some of these questions, uh, we, we saw a lot of similar questions, and I think you already started to address them. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think to begin, one of the questions was from Selena, and Josh had a similar one. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about your land, energy, and water footprints relative to other forms of CDR. And to tack onto that, whether you have any other nutrient inputs outside of that nutrient-rich water that you mentioned you pump into your ponds. Yes. A very good question. So there are seasons when things don't grow very well. In the winter time, it's colder. Um, there's less upwelling, and um, and and yes, we do need to be very conscious of what nutrients we supplement. So to get that really uh, productive environment in our in this Moroccan location currently, it's sort of mid January to mid February, where we would probably not operate the pumps because it's just not uh, very effective. There are sandstorms. Um, it's not a very easy time to operate, but there are sort of two months on either side of that where we would supplement some nutrients. Um, and we are very careful to make sure that those are low carbon content nutrients. Um, and that's particularly, um, green nitrogen. Um, it cannot be very energetically expensive. Um, and the same thing is true, uh, with green phosphorus. We're talking about just for the Konoshenki and the audience, we're talking about seven micromolar of, of, of nutrients as opposed to things like 800 H3 micromolar in your algal cultivation biofuel pond. So it's very small amounts, but the fact is, is we are very conscious where that comes from and how it's made. The same is true in terms of the embedded carbon in our materials, but it's also true in terms of the, we are, you can imagine hot desert, cold ocean, there's a lot of wind. So we are surrounded by wind farms and also solar farms. Fortunately, Morocco is very leading in creating renewable energy. And so all we, all our energy is renewable already. And we can make sure that we only purchase renewable energy in the sense. Okay, that's excellent. And I think you mentioned also the, the land use. There's not a lot of competitive land uses in the coastal desert. Um, could you just confirm the, the land? And is there any freshwater um, usage that we should know about? Yeah, so there, uh, we make some fresh water actually, uh, for the purpose of, uh, cleaning cycles and sort of clean phase systems. Um, we are very, very conscious of the fresh water that we make because it's expensive. Um, it's very difficult to get in our area and, uh, Moroccans are very frugal. Um, their usage is very humble in a sense. Um, we very actively work with the local community. We create jobs. We do a lot of training. Half of our employees are female, um, which is, which is, you know, in very conservative parts of the world. But the fact is, is we also are regulated by the Moroccan government. Um, it's not a mystery to them what we're doing. Uh, we have to do the EIAs and all the other approvals. Um, and, and, and we pay our local fees and duties and taxes. And so the point is, this is not something that's happening in spite of the government. And they're very careful about managing, uh, again, as you say, the sort of water budget and the energy budget for the local community. Got it. And um, I don't know if you have these details, but do you have a sense for specifically the amount of energy that's required to sequester per ton, even if it is renewably sourced? Um, I don't have it at my fingertip. I wish my engineers were here. We do. It's very competitive. I mean, the reason why I say that is most of the uh, power that we use is first for the pumping, um, then for some of the paddle wheels. Uh, and we spent a lot of time stripping energy out of those finding super efficient pumps, uh, that, you know, pump 19 tons a second. I mean, they're, they really do a lot. Um, we don't have a lot of elevation to pump over. We use enormous pipes. Um, the point is, uh, most of the work of the actual CO2 sequestration is done by sunlight and the algae. So a lot of the systems that are either chemically or forcefully capturing that CO2 require a lot of energy input. And we don't because the, because basically the algae and the sunlight do the hard work for us. Great. Thank you for that. 
Um, shifting gears a little bit, you spoke um, about your current status and kind of current net sequestration capacity. Can you speak a little bit to what you anticipate in 2030 um, and whether you're working with anyone to uh, certify your methodology or third party kind of verifi verifiers? So first thing we had to do, we have we have had to make a new life cycle analysis just to sort of define the system, get the boundaries right, uh, make sure that we really do include everything. Um, and as you know, it's a, uh, ISO regulated uh, structured process. We've done it deliberately in a way where we can compare um, uh, to other algal and other environmental processes. Um, then we are in the process, we've got a consultant to help us make our so-called proto-protocol um, in anticipation of the, of the um, sort of um, independent verification. And um, as you also know, these days, a lot of the certifying bodies are very busy and overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so we're uh, very actively looking for um, some partners that uh, have the capacity to do that. That process has already started. I mean, we're working on our proto protocol now. We've got on our team somebody who's actually structuring all the data collection for the purpose of creating the kind of baseline information, how we impact right. the local environment. And so the answer is that that process is running. We are not yet, there's no independent protocol out there yet, but we're definitely working towards it in an active manner. Great. And um, have you thought about 2030, what that might look like? Are you guys allowing yourselves to make those kinds of projections? So we're very focused on, on next year building a 30 hectare site that does about 3,000 tons of CO2 per year um, to be able to get the financing for that 1,000 uh, hectare production module. At that point, we are moving a lot of water. I mean, that 1,000 uh, uh, hectare module moves about 2.2 billion tons, 2.2 cubic kilometers of seawater per year, um, we're going to have impact at that point. Uh, 100,000 tons of CO2 per year is not very large, uh, but in, in the big global context, but it's very large in terms of the supply of carbon credits these days. And so in that sense, um, we are very actively thinking about it, but more short term. Um, the, the reason I say that is, um, for us, it's very important to be able to get that right, because once we have that production module, there are two things that happen. We can see the glide path to bringing down the price of a offset significant. And today we're below $200 a ton, but at that point we want to get even lower below $100 a ton. That's number one for the scale benefits and sort of further improvement and automation. The second thing is we're very keen on having that, um, uh, having the, that we have 6,100 hectares of land and then rolling out first in Morocco and making that side as large as possible. Then going to a country like Namibia, Chile or Oman, we have still 3,200 hectares of land that we have access to in Oman. And so we're very carefully thinking about that scale-up plan, but we're not there yet. And so I don't want to make a prediction, but but you are correct in the sense that we feel there's urgency in trying to provide a solution. We need all the different solutions, but the fact is, is we're, we, we can't wait to 2050 to crack this. Right. Um, and one of the things that I think is really special about your organization is that you're, you know, you're nearing your 10th birthday. Um, some of the folks that we see on this is CDR, you know, just launched recently. Maybe you can speak a little bit about how your business model has evolved over that time. Maybe there have been some trade-offs that you guys have made. How did you guys, you know, what were some of those twists and turns along the way that landed you where you are yeah, today? It's a very good question. I mean, reality is a, is a really tough uh, challenge. And, and, and we struggled in the beginning with bringing the price down. Uh, of, of the carbon sequestration and bringing the price down of the biomass production. And, and it required us to think about the, um, the algal growth cycle differently. It required us to think about our ponds differently. When we started, for example, they were 50 centimeters deep. Now they're more than a meter deep. We can handle more volume in a smaller space. Um, we've thought very actively about the land utilization and not having lots of empty spaces between the ponds, how often we fill the ponds, just to be able to get that uh, additional productivity. Um, the other thing that we've learned is, is that the actual measurement and MRV is very difficult. Um, the Again, we've invented sensors ourselves. We're working with people to, in a sense, use sensors developed for very different purposes. 
um, in, in a new way. Uh, we're actively working with a bunch of sensor developers because it does require very specialized thinking in very dynamic environments. Uh, and even little things like how much sunlight there is, you know, in the summertime, there's literally where we are in Morocco, twice as much sunlight as it is in the wintertime. And, you know, those kinds of things start mattering a lot. Thank you so much for answering these questions. This was excellent. I'll pass back to Toby. Um, yes, thank you. And thank you for staying a few, a few extra minutes with us. Thank you, uh, Irene, for, for doing such a great job with the Q&A. And um, there were tons of questions, great questions. And I apologize that we couldn't get to all of them, but we need to be respectful of Raphael's time and everyone else's because we're running already a little over. So, I, mean, I saw some of the questions flash by just to tell everybody very quickly. Uh, yes, we think about encasing the biomass. Yes, we think about uh, sealing the sites in different ways. But it always is a balancing act of what is, in a sense, stable and affordable. And so, and so we believe we have a very, very low cost solution, um, that is also stable. And, and, and we will continue to explore those alternatives as we go forward. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. And thank you so much for being with us. It was super fascinating. It's very different from most of the programs that we've had. So I think it was super interesting for the audience to hear about this very novel method and very promising method. So um, thank you for being with us. Congratulations on all. It was a big year for you, raising money coming out of stealth and, and uh, best wishes for a even more uh, successful and productive uh, 2023 and hoping you have a nice and lovely holiday break. Thank um, you. Thanks to everybody. And I love what you guys do. So I, I can't wait to dial into the next one. My team listens to you guys all the time. So. Thank you. It's great to hear. Thanks for being with us. And um, everyone who showed up today and stayed with us past the hour, thank you for being with us. Um, thank you for coming to all of the This is CDRs this year. We're looking forward to a big uh, 2023. Um, just a couple quick programming announcements, if I can get my screen to work. Number one, um, Open Air uh, is working on a carbon removal challenge, which is uh, uh, basically an open competition for, for college students to come up with novel carbon removal ideas. It's sponsored by our friends at NYU and by Brink. Um, the deadline, I believe, there is January 8th. So if you have ideas and you're a college student, please uh, connect. I think Chris will put the link to that in the chat. Um, also, if you're a corporate in the audience would like to be involved on the sort of mentorship sponsorship side, uh, there's opportunities for that for this cycle and certainly for future cycles. So please reach out to Open Air if you have any interest in that. Um, number two, um, Open Air is running a crowdsourced project for a very cool biochar project in Uganda. Um, we kind of alluded to this in our intro, but it's really important that, um, that the carbon removal sector uh, uh, in an equitable way incorporates the full global geography. And we need to make sure that benefits of, of this, uh, commercial benefits of the sector are felt in places like Uganda. And so this is a really, I think, well thought out opportunity. Um, we're about 75%, I think, to our goal. Um, it's a very small project. So if you have any interest in making an end of your donation, they're tax deductible. And Chris will put the link to that in the chat. Um, and here is what we've got for January. Um, exciting for uh, the first couple sessions we have coming. Um, we're going to take next week and the following week off. So everyone have a lovely holiday. Um, we have Carboculture, which is a very innovative Finnish um, biochar company that's doing biochar at scale, which is different from what we've seen before um, from biochar practitioners on this program. And they're also generating heat energy that can, for example, heat a small city. So it's super cool what they're doing and excited to have their CEO, Henrietta Moon, who is amazing, um, come on and tell us about what they're working on. Uh, we have a, our first returned guest, um, Marty Odlin uh, from Running Tide, uh, another ocean-based uh, carbon removal company working on, this is macroalgae, not microalgae. And uh, their business has changed quite a bit since he was on over a year ago. So he's going to come on and tell us what's new, which I think will be super interesting to kind of like track how a carbon removal company is advancing uh, their business. Um, then we have Carbon Capture, which is a US-based direct air capture company that currently has the largest uh, announced deployment of five megaton project in Wyoming. And the CEO, Adrian Corliss, is going to be with us to talk about their sort of the, the difference between their uh, method of direct air capture from maybe some of the other ones that have been on the program, and then also more specifically about uh, the deployment in Wyoming. And specifically, they've been doing a lot of work on community engagement, and I would love to look forward to hearing from him about that. And then finally, we have uh, on the 31st of January, we have Stacy Calc from Shopify. Um, everyone knows Stacy, who's in carbon removal, and um, she is going to a talk a little bit about Shopify's um, carbon removal procurement program, but mainly she's going to talk about a new buying guide for CDR that they just published, which is a really great document. And 
one thing that we definitely need is we need to grow the demand side of the sector. And, and that's going to happen in the near term via getting more corporates to act like Stripe, Shopify, Stripe, Microsoft, Swiss Re, et cetera. So she's going to talk about how we might be able to do that. So lots of cool stuff coming up in January. Sorry, everyone, for running over, but I'm glad to have you with us. And um, everyone, have a lovely holiday. Thank you again, uh, Raphael, for, for joining us today. And everyone, be well. See you in 2023. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year.